Hello, am I audible now, sir? Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Okay. So today I begin with a warm welcome to all from the Department of Engineering Sciences, Ram Rawadik Institute of Technology. Welcome to our RAIT live webinar series. You may be pleased to know that it is now under the ambit of the Dr. D.Y. Patil deemed to be university from the academic year 2020-21. And the topic for today's webinar is personal development, sorry, reflective practices for personal development. And the speaker is Dr. Malavika Sharma, assistant professor and ELT trainer at Pillai College of Engineering. Now, soft skills are subjects that we often take during our engineering, in our engineering syllabus, and it includes topics like emotional intelligence, but it is not only about acquiring leadership skills and team building skills, but it also leads to career growth. It also involves becoming self-aware and learning to understand oneself. This is one of the key personal competences under the broader concept of intelligence, uh, sorry, emotional intelligence. And this webinar will focus on these techniques that help us to develop our personality through self-awareness to reflective techniques that can bring about a change in our behavior. Now about the speaker, I'm privileged to introduce uh, you to Dr. Malavika Sharma, a researcher and ELT trainer who enjoys designing activities that focus on development of the four basic language skills. Her research is deeply rooted in game-based learning and metacognitive processes that transcends the boundaries of mere entertainment and fun. She's also a full-time faculty at the undergraduate level with 26 years to her credit. She graduated from the Wilson College, Mumbai, and also obtained her master's degree from the University of Mumbai uh, and a doctorate thereafter with a, in the field of applied linguistics also from the University of Mumbai. Interestingly, her research topic was test taking strategies in reading comprehension and uh, Dr. Sharma likes to keep herself involved in multiple ELT projects and in writing poems and stories. So we have a complete personality here who involves herself in ELT, literature, and soft skills too. She's also published nine research papers and uh, two of them in international journals and the rest in the national journals. Uh, in 2015, the Indian Council of Social Science Research sanctioned rupees four lakhs for her project on effectiveness of game-based learning for the undergraduate students of engineering. Dr. Sharma has organized many soft skill development programs and also has done research on group discussion techniques that have helped students to acquire the four language skills other than the soft skills training that she imparts to her students. So I welcome Dr. Sharma. It is my privilege to have you on our webinar today. So I request you to take over from me and begin your presentation. Good evening, participants. Thank you, Anupama Madam, for the introduction. And also, I would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity. So for this, I would like to share my screen. Give me just a few moments. visible. Okay. So I'll begin my uh, sharing my experience on how I incorporated reflective strategies or reflective practices in my learning. So I hope people over here will definitely uh, take this opportunity to implement these practices, uh, the reflective practices in their uh, life also. I always wanted to pursue my career in teaching. And 
Thus, you know, when I enrolled myself for my bachelor degree course in 1988, I, I was very happy because I had uh, selected the subjects which interested me, except for one where I was forced to opt for the subject and that was political science. I never liked political science, but I was fortunate enough to have my teacher who was extremely helpful, motivating, and also he was uh, he developed and uh, the curiosity in all of us to explore new things at the same time my teacher was instrumental in introducing presentation skills in uh, in the class which was not there in our curr curriculum so what he did was he used to encourage all of us to give the presentation and during those days we did not have the computer so therefore, you know, the question of preparing slides uh, wasn't there, but uh, uh, we all, but definitely our teacher encouraged us to use the blackboard and the chalk to write down the points so that our presentation is interactive. As all of them got turns to present, I keenly observed their presentation. But when my turn came, I was extremely nervous and I was almost shaking and I felt very uncomfortable. This feeling was aggravated when I observed that my teacher, apart from listening attentively to what I was saying, was also noting down certain points. I immediately uh, started feeling nervous and during my nervousness, I actually struggled I had to remember my points and I started fumbling and this is where, you know, uh, I knew my presentation was going wrong. I somehow ended my presentation abruptly. Now, from this uh, experience, I would say that my first reaction was that I felt extremely miserable. Then, I also felt sad and afraid to meet the teacher or to even interact with the teacher. In fact, for some few days, I stopped interacting with my friends. Gradually, I gathered courage and started communicating with my friends. And then I also approached my teacher to find out I, uh, to, to get his feedback, to uh, understand what were his comments. My teacher pointed out many mistakes in my presentation, but also suggested remedies for the same. I felt worse and I decided that I'm not going to pursue my career in teaching. But accidentally, after my post-graduation, I landed up in the teaching job. I welcomed this new role and was extremely happy and comfortable with my students, sharing information, and at the same time, also learning new things from my students. So, and I was quite devoted to my job, but sooner the memories of my first presentation started haunting me as I was forced to participate in a conference. But I took this opportunity to learn from my mistakes by first of all, trying to find out what went wrong in my presentation. So I started asking myself certain questions. Like for example, I came up with the question, what exactly went wrong during the first presentation? Why did it go wrong? Where did I go wrong and how I can bring about these changes so that I, I can modify my mistakes and I can also try and give a better presentation. So this introspection that I went through actually helped me to understand my mistakes as well as it helped me to work on consciously uh, towards, you know, uh, trying to, you know, uh, understand the mistakes and try to rectify my mistakes. 
so that I do not make it again in my next presentation. Plan my ideas ac accurately, systematically, and also rehearse for my presentations. This analysis also helped me to understand that it is important for all of us to take responsibility of our own actions. And with this, I also learned that, you know, it, uh, our, the side effects of failure can be easily managed. So having shared my experience with you, I now move ahead to uh, share with you the structure of my talk. So the first topic that I'll be dealing with is what is reflection? The second is what is reflective practice? The third is why should I reflect? The fourth is reflection versus reflective practice. The fifth is types of reflection. The sixth, the Gibbs theory of reflection. And then I move on to the last topic that is reflection and personal development. So let us start with what is reflection. Here we can see a, a girl standing in front of the mirror and looking at herself. This scene, I'm sure it is quite familiar to you all. Because as we can see, we are all, all the time doing this particular scene uh, every day when we leave our house, you know, for work, or for you know, going to the market for shopping, or even going to the doctor. So we all do this. We stand in front of the mirror and we have a good look at ourselves. What do we do by standing in front of the mirror? Well, we try to find out whether we conform to the suitability of the occasion. So we minutely look at our clothes that we wear, our hairstyle and our makeup. And as we are looking at ourselves very carefully, we then try to make adjustments to our hairstyle, to the clothes, as well as to the makeup. And these adjustments are made smiling and enjoying. We enjoy doing, make, uh, making these changes or doing these changes without losing our confidence. So as we can see that the very idea of reflection which is considered to be a skill that is already, you know, we already implement it in our lives unknowingly. We do not even realize that we always, we are involved in the act of reflection. And this skill, however, if we take it, you know, to the academic section or the academic sector or to the professional sector and the personal sector will definitely change us as a human being and we'll also understand that we can become independent learners. So my aim is to tell you how we can do that. So let us first understand what is reflective practice. Reflective practice is reflection, but then if we are talking about, you know, trying to uh, develop our individual traits, our individual learning, then we are talking about a systematic approach systematic and a deliberate approach. It is purposeful. We tend to bring in this uh, reflection, reflective uh, uh, reflection, you know, very consciously and also following certain steps. So the aim of this reflective practice is to enable us to learn. So when we're talking about reflection, we think about what we should do at that particular moment we are thinking that what we can do so that we can improve ourselves. For example, suppose I have been given a task to write a paragraph. Most of the time, after completing the task, we merely submit it or merely give it to the teacher to read the paragraph. So if you are involved in reflective practice, what we will do is, we will not, well, before giving it to the teacher, before submitting it to the teacher, first of all, we will go through what we have written all by ourselves. Then we will come forward with questions that would help us understand whether we have completed the task efficiently. 
for example questions like um, have i um, have i uh, planned my paragraph systematically logically is there any grammatical mistakes in the sentences that i have written can i identify is there any spelling mistake i need to check my spelling mistakes and this way you know i can or have i uh, incorporated the idea the way i wanted it to do it is my idea clear to the uh, audience or clear to the readers so all these things will help us to get a better understanding of um, you know making those changes um, that you know should actually help us to become independent learners or help us to learn better now if these changes are told to us by a teacher then most of the time uh, we do not appreciate it because we feel that uh, it, uh, we are being humiliated in front of the other students number one secondly it is the ego that hurts us number two and third we don't want to be told by anybody that what we have written is not to the mark so if we don't want anybody to tell us we need to improve ourselves because there is scope for improvement at every aspect so how can we do that we can only do that when we start reflecting so reflecting on our actions you know it should be for continuous learning for lifelong learning and the when we reflect and how we use it will all determine the success that means it will all determine to what extent uh, we are able to improve ourselves so with this let us move on to the next topic that is why should i reflect is it necessary for me to reflect when the teacher teaches so well in the classroom when the teacher provides us with all the notes is it necessary that i should reflect should be involved in this act it is so tedious it is very very boring it is a long process who who would like to reflect but we should all reflect because if we reflect we can ensure that we learn from our experience learning from our experience has a better impact than learning from you know people who tell us about their experience then the second is it deepens your learning it gives you a better idea about the topic about the subject matter and thus you will be able to answer any questions um, that uh, you are that that is asked you know during examination or uh, during an interview for example and then it makes sense of what has happened whether success or failure then the next is it can help me in my future actions and then it is useful for interviews presentations and public speaking let me give you an example how it is useful in interviews now during interviews uh, the interviewers usually ask a question can you narrate a incident in your life uh, that is uh, that it can, can be considered a memorable one so in this particular question unless and until you have reflected on what has happened in your life you will not be able to answer this question so it is understood that you have to reflect on all your actions on all your experience uh, before you can answer questions like this then of course the presentations and public speaking it is an opportunity for all of us that during presentation and public speaking we are always open or we should be open uh, to um, learning new things each time we come forward with a presentation and public speaking for example the the every time when i am participating in any kind of presentation i always when i reflect on it i always learn something i always learn um uh, how to you know become uh, you know change myself change my slides prepare my slides i could have prepared my slide in a different manner i could have conveyed a message in the, this message in a different manner and so what is happening is i am trying to learn how to uh, you know approach the topic in a different way most importantly after my presentation i always try to find out 
in what different way, in what unique way I can present my ideas. And that actually sets me thinking. So when I'm reflecting, I'm actually beginning the process of thinking. And this is the most important aspect that we need to develop in ourselves. And then we become more responsible because uh, we become matured enough, we think, we become responsible, we become thoughtful, and we also tend to implement whatever we have learned in our day-to-day -day life or in our academic setting. So having understood the importance of reflection, now let us move ahead uh, to the uh, difference between reflection versus reflective practice. So as I told you, reflection is uh, related in our day-to-day -day life. You know, we don't even realize we are doing reflection. We are involved in this skill, such an important skill. But we are always doing it in our life. You know, your mom cooks and suppose, you know, something goes wrong in her cooking. She reflects, you know, what ingredient did I add or what ingredient did I miss out that, you know, it is uh, tasting so horrible. Or suppose if the taste is very good, you know, it is, um, uh, I mean, it is everyone starts licking their fingers. Then also you start, you tend to reflect on what was the good thing that I added and how did I add so that, you know, I will, uh, I will try to remember. And next time when I prepare the same dish, I will uh, see to it that I, you know, it the same taste, you know, or it, it becomes better rather than uh, going to the worse side. So now, uh, you know, when I talk about reflection, we do it con unconsciously or rather we don't even realize we're doing reflection. But uh, this experience allows us to uh, make, you know, links from our experience to the next experience. Whereas reflective practice, you know, it is, as I told you, it is a deliberate act. And of course, uh, you know, this experience, you know, actually gives us new insights into ourselves. And uh, that is important because we want to understand ourselves better first. We want to understand ourselves in a, at a deeper level uh, to what extent we have acquired the information. So we have more, uh, uh, a scope you know, to uh, find out to what extent you know, we are able to uh, and get a grasp of the knowledge of the particular subject. Now, let us uh, now move on to the next topic uh, that is types of reflection. There are two types of reflection. One is the inaction reflection. So inaction means uh, as we are experiencing the process, we begin reflecting. To give you an example, let us take uh, the question of uh, the, the situation where we are reading a passage. So when we read the passage, first of all, if we are taught to reflect, you know, while we are reading the passage, well, how will we read it? Of course, the teacher will definitely give us the guiding questions, how to re reflect upon it. So the first thing that will come to your mind is, we see the title of the passage, and from the title, we try to uh, tap for background information, we try to find out um, uh, what information we already have um, about this uh, particular topic. That is a prior knowledge is important. So we tend to think about the prior knowledge and we also tend to find out from where we have acquired this prior knowledge. Did we read it in the newspaper? Did we read it in the book? From where did I get this prior knowledge? And in what context was this prior knowledge used? So once we try and think about all these questions, immediately we can associate or we can try to find out the link of what the writer is communicating and what knowledge we already have. We can link both of them and this linking, you know, will help us to understand, to get a better understanding of the particular, um, you know, the topic or what the writer is, uh, you know, talking about his own perspective with the particular issue. Uh, then this inaction um, technique is also called as a think aloud technique. Now you must have observed sometimes that children, you know, they uh, talk aloud, you know, they start speaking to themselves, they talk loudly. So this think aloud technique is very important or rather it is becoming uh, a way of, uh, you know, helping, you know, children and adults also learn better. So though it is not very popular in the Indian context, but still I'm sure within a few years, it will also become popular in the Indian context. 
but in other countries it is um, it is all it is incorporated in the curriculum and the think aloud technique is used you know for understanding concepts and for actually um, uh, enhancing the process of reflection now the other thing is um, you know, the in action example would be in the form of games now games are incorporated in the curriculum by the teacher for two reasons that is number 1 to test the skill and number 2 to teach a skill so by games you know the teacher wants to motivate the students to uh, learn better now is motivating directly with the help of words then we introduce it in the form of games uh, there is a feeling of excitement there is a feeling of fun and because of this excitement and fun element uh, automatically the students are motivated so additional motivation is not required when you are introducing games now as the child starts playing games he is or uh, he understands that he has to win the game because there is an element of competition in the game so he has to win the game so he starts you know trying to implement the strategies that would help him to win the game after he implements the strategies he, he finds that he is not able to win the game so what does this person do he starts reflecting he starts thinking he goes back to the strategy he starts finding out what is wrong with the strategy why he couldn't win this game and uh, therefore you know that uh, forces him to come up with a new strategy or that forces him to uh, think for an alternative strategy and so we say that uh, games you know indirectly uh, helps you in the process of reflection and you also tend to come up with uh, you know strategies uh, that um, uh, that could be really new and uh, nobody would might have used it but uh, you have decided to use it and uh, you have also uh, you know achieved success because of that now the next uh, type of reflection is the on action reflection on action is um, that is after you have experienced after your experience is complete you reflect on that experience you uh, you reflect on that particular experience because you want to learn something out of that experience like for example in my case i reflected on my first presentation because i wanted to learn how to avoid you know making the same mistakes in my next presentation so i wanted to learn that and i also wanted um, you know to improve my presentation uh in whatever ways i could and so therefore i reflected on that particular experience so this is after the experience now many of us know that it is through experience only or we can or it is through reflection that uh, we can learn we can have a better understanding and uh, but still you know there are people who will not uh, learn from their experience and if you don't learn from their experience if you don't reflect on experience then learning is impossible this is where gibbs theory of reflective cycle is useful because according to gibbs it is important that you learn by doing only when you do the act then you are involved in the process of learning otherwise it is not possible for a person to learn so let us now go on to the next uh, part of presentation that is gibbs theory gibbs reflective cycle so according to gibbs reflective cycle we have a description first and then we have feelings and after that we have evaluation and then we have the analysis part and then we have conclusion then after that we have the action plan i will be explaining all this uh, different aspects you know in detail so gives believed that anybody you can help yourself as well as you can help others to work on a particular situation following this cycle following the steps and so that you can do better you can perform better in future you can improve yourself so let us start with the description first this is the first step so in the first step um, as an individual you can uh, perform this act on your own or you can 
um, you know, take the help of the teacher who can uh, give you guiding questions. And this guiding questions will help you to describe that experience. So what are the questions? The first is when and where did this happen? For example, when we are traveling, suppose we come across an accident. We are disturbed, you know, when we see the accident, sometimes we cannot do anything. We cannot help in that uh, accident, the place of accident. So, but we are totally disturbed. And uh, we even uh, start, you know, panicking at times. By the time we reach home, you know, it is reflected on a face that something has happened. So the best person to understand the change is a mother. So mother will inquire when and when did this happen or we'll start inquiring first what happened and then we'll start when when it happened where did it happen so these are the reflective questions which is um, you know posed by your mother so that you can narrate the experience that comes why were you there what was the reason why were you there and then who else was there was anybody around you and then what happened what exactly happened, you know, so you have to even go to the minute details when you are describing your experience. And then comes, what did you and the other people do? So you also have to give, an, um, give a uh, knowledge of what the other people were doing and then what was the result of the situation. So this is how you describe your experience according to Gibbs reflective cycle. Then we move on to the next step, that second step, that is feelings. Not only do we have to uh, describe our uh, uh, experience, we also need to find out the feelings. Feelings before the situation, feelings during the situation, and then feelings of other people, and then the feelings after the situation. Then after that, what do you think now? What is your experience now? What is your feeling now? And then what do you think other people felt? So just take my example of um, when I narrated my experience. My feelings before was, I was already feeling nervous. I was already feeling uncomfortable. During the presentation, what happened to me? I started feeling uncomfortable because after I observed the teacher writing down points. Feelings of the other people and the other people for the other people, it did not make any difference. They were just observing me, you know, that I'm getting nervous, I'm fumbling, I'm struggling to remember points. So the other people were like, what happened to her? You know, they were like, uh, uh, they had no role to play, but then uh, they were, uh, maybe they're astonished, they were stunned, or uh, they were indifferent uh, near to that particular situation. Feelings after after my experience, what were my feelings? I felt miserable, I felt sad, I felt afraid. What do you think now? Now I think I should not have expressed those feelings of sadness, of uh, um, you know, being afraid, of not communicating with my friends. It was, uh, it was totally not required. It was totally unreasonable. So what I could have done instead, I could have actually uh, reflected on my um, taken responsibility of my actions and reflected on the situation in a more logical manner so that I could make those changes in my next presentation. I could learn from my experience. What do you think other people felt? Other people might have felt that uh, she has not rehearsed well and that is why the nervousness. It is quite obvious. Everybody will feel like that. Okay. So having understood uh, the second step, let us now go on to the third step that is evaluation. So for every experience, there is always a positive and a negative outcome. So according to Gibbs, first, we always have to talk about the positive outcome. What was positive about the situation? It cannot be that all our experiences are negative. There must be some positive element in that experience. And that is very important to identify. So when you talk about the positive aspect, immediately you feel that you have uh, you have done something or you have um, you know uh, involved yourself in an act which is not to be regretted and then comes the negative aspect what was negative about it and then what went well 
and what went, what did not go so well, and what did you and your other people do to contribute to the situation? Now, in in the in the experience that I shared, uh, you must have realized uh, that uh, my fumbling and my you know trying to re recollect the points aggravated after observing my teacher writing down points. Okay, so the very act of writing down points that aggravated the situation that led to this particular situation. So the teacher was not responsible, but the act of writing down points, noting down the points itself contributed to this nervousness. And that is when I realized that I ended my presentation abruptly. So um, what didn't go so well? So this, all these things did not go so well. It was not according to my expectations, neither it was according to the expectations of my teacher. So after evaluation, we are going to start with the next step, that is the analysis. And the analysis tells us uh, why did we pick up the situation. In my case, I picked up the situation deliberately so that I could um, incorporate uh, certain changes in my presentation, in my attitude, in my behavior, and also in after the presentation, you know, uh, how to react with the audience, how to deal with the situation, I could bring about those changes. So I picked up the situation to reflect on. Then what sense can you make of it? And does it make sense given the preceding three stages? Yes, it makes sense. And what is the main area of concern or focus in the future? So my area of concern is uh, to give a presentation which is flawless. And to, towards this, I'll be working hard and uh, I will try and give my best each time I give a presentation. The next step is, step number five is conclusion. So in the conclusion, I'm going to talk about how could this have been a more positive experience for everyone involved. It could have been a positive experience had I uh, taken the action of the teacher in a positive manner. Had I undertake, uh, understood that the teacher was writing down the points in order to appreciate my efforts, in order to appreciate my style of presentation, my the, um, the way I was, uh, you know, like uh, explaining the points and so on, my knowledge and so on. So that would have been a better experience for me as well as for the other people around. And then if I'm faced with the same situation again, what would you do but differently? Yes, if I'm faced with the same situation again, I will consider all the aspects that the teacher or the other students are doing you know, very positively. I will have eye contact with everyone. I will not try to shift my glance away from the audience. I will try maintain eye contact with the teacher also. And I'll try to make the session as interactive as possible. Then what skills you need to be uh, to develop so that you handle this type of situation better? The skill, the best, the most important skill is, first of all, analyze your analytical skills and of course your evaluation skills, very, very important. We need to analyze our own presentation. We need to analyze our own, uh, we need to evaluate our own presentation. We need to evaluate our own understanding as well. We need to evaluate our approach towards, you know, uh, in, uh, towards using reflective strategies or reflective practices before we arrive at a conclusion. And then we move on to the next um, uh, category, next step that is action. Here comes the most important part according to Gibbs reflective cycle. So he says that have you come up with a plan so that you can make these changes. So it is important for you to understand that you need to come up with a specific plan. If you don't have a specific plan, it's of no use, you know, using the reflective cycle or reflecting upon your experience. So the next thing, are you committed to the plan? We all have to be committed to the plan. If you are not committed, we will not be able to you know, bring these changes within ourselves. And then have you set any deadline? Very important. We have to set a deadline so that we can review our progress to what extent we have been able to implement okay, the changes 
um, in our, for example, in my case, it was the presentation. So uh, in this reflective cycle, if it is followed, you know, sincerely, and if it is followed continuously, will definitely help each one of us to understand or to mod rectify and modify our mistakes and, uh, um, you know, move towards a better, um, you know, a better uh, interaction, a better um, understanding of people, as well as a better understanding of ourselves. Now, let us move on to the next aspect that is reflection and personal development. How can reflection be incorporated in personal development and how it is useful for personal development. So let us first understand that personal development means uh, the combination of certain factors. For example, we start with better understanding of others. In the society, we observe that uh, we do not understand each other. We have a strong uh, you know, dislike towards uh, other people. We ridicule people. We make fun of people. When we see someone in pain, uh, it, it, it becomes a source of gossip for all of us. We don't try to understand others. And this is where we are going wrong. And this is where we find that most of the people, you know, they are undergoing uh, this uh, problem of depression. Most of them are suffering because of depression. This depression is because people are not ready to understand the problems of the other person. Okay, so they take advantage most of the time, you know, uh, you are you don't even realize when people, you know, speak, you know, sweetly and tend to do things, you know, that uh, you never thought of. And once, you know, uh, you, you come to your senses, you have already been destroyed by this person. So this is what happens. And then develop creative thinking skills. So uh, with reflection, you know, when you are involved in the act of creation, uh, you will definitely, uh, you know, bring about a lot of changes. Your thinking process, your positivity comes in there when you start, you know, creating something new. So you can direct your, uh, you know, like your negative negativity or your negative feelings about yourself, about, you know, what is happening around you by starting to create or expressing your thoughts in a creative manner. And that will actually help you uh, to, you know, have this positive thinking as well as um, it will help you to understand people better because creation means you are uh, actually putting a lot of thought into the process when you are creating. It is not an easy task. Everybody cannot be creators, um, but we can at least try to create something new or something you know that is better for the society, better for ourselves. Then conduct productive relationships. Now all relationships are related to money. There's so much of negativity in the relationship. It is very difficult to trust people. Even sometimes, you know, only the mother and child relationship appears to be pure. I am saying it appears to be pure because a mother uh, devotes her entire life uh, to the upbringing of the child. But uh, most of the time, we, we have come across that when the child grows up, he becomes an adult, he gets married, he gets settled. He is no longer, you know, uh, he doesn't feel responsible, you know, to look after his mother. Sometimes some, uh, you know, there's some children, they do it. That's because, you know, they are more interested in the um, money that is in the bank, okay, uh, rather than, you know, looking after mother. There's no feeling as such. And that puts me wondering, what is, what is there in relationships, you know, like we are, no, nothing is pure, everything is, you know, like uh, valued in terms of money. So, for example, you know, the relationship between uh, the, uh, the student and the teacher, that also, you know, sometimes, you know, I have a big question mark over there. So being a teacher myself also, I put a big question mark because uh, students, you know, they uh, greet you, uh, only when, you know, they know that, you know, the teacher is going to give us term work marks. The moment the term work chapter is over, okay, then they forget the teacher. They don't even recognize the teacher. 
Okay, so that forces the teacher also to behave in this manner. So why wouldn't if the the students are doing this, we will also do the same thing. We also forget the students after you know one semester is over. We have no relation with the other students, so then it's all forgotten. It's all over. So as long as you are there in my class, you are my student. But the moment you leave, you go to the next semester. I don't recognize you. I don't know who you are. Okay, so it is a, a mutual, you know, scene, you know, that goes on. Okay, so in order to, you know, change this entire approach, one has to see to it that the relationships are productive in the sense both of them learn from one another. Both of them are able to, um, you know, uh, share the views and uh, acquire information and uh, learn from, you know, uh, share their experiences and learn from each other's experiences. And that is possible only when we share the bond, you know, that is so much required in the present gener uh, in the present situation. And then managing stress. Now, stress is something, you know, which is which we all experience, which is which has become a part of our life, whether it is physical and whether it is mental, it is bound to be there. So, for example, uh, today I am stressed because yesterday, last night, I was awake till 4 a.m. I hardly got any sleep. So then I am physically stressed. OK, mentally also I am stressed because I am under pressure. I'm under pressure as I have to give my best. And so therefore, this pressure, you know, finally, you know, if, if I am not uh, directing it in the proper direction, managing it in the proper direction, it can be really harmful. Okay, so stress can be either positive or negative, And we'll deal with greater detail in the next slides. I'll tell you about how we can manage stress. Then next is managing emotions. It is not necessary that we have to express all emotions uh, in front of the other people. We have to, there, there are times we need to express our emotions, but we need to have a control over our emotions uh, because number one, it is very difficult to identify how many uh, people you know, actually um, understands our emotional state of mind. It is most of the time, the people, you know, they want to uh, enjoy you know, by observing our emotional status. So it is better we try to have control over our emotions. And if at all we have to experience, we have to first identify the person who is reliable, who is trustworthy, and then we can express our emotions in front of that person. So very carefully, we need to express our emotions. Very carefully, we need to share our thoughts with the other person. And, um, and with that surety that the person will guide us, will be able to manage our emotions and guide it in the right direction. So when we are uh, developing or uh, into the process of uh, creative thinking, uh, we tend to forget all the problems that we are surrounded with. So we, we want to come up with a new solution and we think positively all the time. So the negativity that surrounds us in the form of, uh, you know, uh, like um, uh, treating somebody poorly, not uh, understanding, not trustworthy people around us, all this negativity will vanish the moment we involve ourselves in the act of creation. Now, let me go on to the next uh, uh, aspect that is empathy. I strongly believe in empathy. Because I believe that no two people can have the same qualities. They can be people who have, uh, you know, average quality or who can have, you know, a minimum quality uh, or a very less quality or may not have any quality at all. But then, you know, we should not try and underestimate that person. He might be good at something else. Okay, that is one. Secondly, empathy is required because we tend to, we have to put ourselves in the position of others in order to understand what the person is going through. So if I am under tremendous pain, unless and until, you know, the other person understands what I am feeling, will not be able to guide me accordingly, will not be able to help me. 
So if only the person understands, then I most of my pain will vanish the moment you know the person understands and starts talking to me in a very friendly manner. Because there are people uh, who you know are born with disabilities, and these people we all know that they need our help and our love. So. if we are able to help them in any way possible without making them realize that we sympathize with them they don't want a sympathy they want us you know to understand their feelings i remember when i was in college uh, that time uh, one of my classmates uh, she was actually blind and uh, it is to happen she used to stay in the hostel which was very close to the college but then she is most of the time she used to walk alone you know to the hostel since my house was not very far off i also used to love walking you know back home and on occasions when i used to see her on in the road on the road i never um, ever you know used to tell her that can i help you can i take you you know drop you to the hostel and so i used to always uh, you know tell her that uh, is it okay if i walk along with you and she used to feel very happy about it so without even making that person realize uh, that i am trying to help okay i can always be of help because i knew it will be difficult for her to walk on the road uh, so therefore i used to actually most of the time i used to drop her to the hostel and then i used to go home so what i'm trying to say is this empathy quality is missing in all of us and uh, i strongly believe that this is a skill that needs to be incorporated in our syllabus in the curriculum and this is a skill that we all ought to learn we all ought to understand what the other person is going through and accept the person as he or she is and not make fun of that person and never um, you know underestimate the person in terms of you know he is uh, not able to um, the, give a good uh, i mean not able to express the skills or whatever they might be having some other skills that we are not possessing okay so with this i would say that uh, when people are anxious when people are depressed it is very important that we uh, listen we become good listeners or we uh, um, we patiently listen to whatever they want to say so that if they talk out if they express you know whatever the thoughts are they definitely uh, they will be able to uh, you know lessen the burden uh, that they are uh, that they have you know kept inside them and uh, the anger also you know like it is very important that uh, people who are angry uh, they might uh, instead of you know asking them to stop being angry you know you can always be calm and listen to them why what is what reason you know they are they are angry and accordingly try and help them out by giving them solutions uh, so uh, with empathy i will also talk about stress managing stress is very important stress as we all know is a pressure and stress can be positive if it is positive it motivates us and if it is negative then of course um, it has the a uh, serious toll on our health physical health as well as a mental health now the negative stress can occur uh, due to you know some the death in a family or uh, uh, if you have observed an accident if you have seen an accident um, that could lead to um, a negative uh, stress now i'll give an example you know like uh, for some people you know the positive stress of one person who feels positive about a particular situation about a particular pressure can be can uh, be negative for someone else for example you know, a person who loves you know to participate in public speaking for him or her public speak the act of participating in public speaking is a positive stress whereas for the person who hesitates to participate in public speaking who has the fear of facing the audience who starts trembling in you know, the very word public speaking will have a negative stress so what is positive for one person might be negative for the other person so um, whatever it is the, the best way to manage stress is first of all to recognize what factors has led to you led to, to the stress so recognizing those factors is very important 
the most of the time we are not able to recognize the factors if we do not recognize the factors we will not be able to resolve the factors so it is important that first of all we sit calm we relax and then we try to identify what factors have led to this stress and after we identify then we can start asking these questions i feel like this because because of whatever reason i feel like this because i did not sleep well last night i feel tired because i did not sleep well last night then this has happened to me because i never you know i did not rehearse my presentation so this has happened to me uh, i realize now that it is so important for me to re to rehearse my presentations this has made me understand that um uh, it is important for all of us uh, to concentrate or to give a better performance whenever we are uh, given the opportunity to do so and then i will take necessary steps the next time when i am given an opportunity to talk to address the audience so this is how we can manage stress and now we move on to the next aspect that is how to conduct productive relationships now when i'm talking about productive relationship there are certain things that we need to keep in mind the certain behaviors that we have to discard the certain behaviors we have to nourish for example let us start with developing trust so i have you know certain behaviors which i have marked as correct behavior and the other behaviors i have marked it as incorrect behavior so when we are talking about trust whether you know the trust between you know like a, a husband and wife or it could be trust you know in an organization between the superior and the subordinate between colleagues or it could be trust uh, in the in a, in a family relation okay so as the child you know trust his his mother uh, blindly okay so similarly that kind of trust should be built when we are talking about relationships so um mostly in an organization we observe that you know gossiping is very common organization or outside the organizations also gossiping is very common and you gossip about what when the, about the person who is not present otherwise you talk to that person and you you know like uh, you know you share information you share you know your you eat together you do everything together but when that person is not there and you start talking about the person that it amounts to gossiping and this gossiping is a negative aspect or a negative behavior which we one should not indulge in if you are talking about developing trust or building relationships because what happens during gossip is that you tend to add your own you know uh, what to say masala or your own you know this uh, thing ideas into it you put in your own ideas without even trying to find out the evidence or the proof of those ideas so in this way you know it can actually spoil the reputation of the person it can spoil the reputation if it is related to an organization it can definitely spoil the reputation of the organization as well so if, uh, in relationship this can be very harmful if you gossip about the other person in his absence now the next is communicate all the time we love to talk oh, all of us we love to talk every time but how much time we spend in listening to others we hardly spend time in listening to others we only spend time you know trying to gossip about the other person or arriving at some weird conclusions about the other person we jump into conclusions most of the time but it is very important in a relationship whether as i said husband wife relationship or girlfriend boyfriend relationship or relationship with your partner so or your friend so all this relationship you need to lend your ears you need to listen to that person understand that person not only just listen but you know listen attentively and understand the person 
so that you uh, you can you know resolve all your problems most of the divorce cases that is happening around us in india or in abroad in india now it has aggravated now more so many divorce cases are coming up this divorce cases are all because of poor listening skills you don't want to listen to the other person you only have to you want to express your own viewpoint and that is where you know the relationship starts disintegrating uh, then comes the support others we have to support others we have to help others an elderly person also if we see walking on the road if that person requires help we need to help the person we um, we need to extend our help you know voluntarily accept our help um, i mean uh, help the person but what we usually observe is that uh, i have observed it many times you know while traveling by train i have observed that you know people just don't offer seat you know to elderly people or you know to pregnant women they never offer the seat so it is really surprising why they don't offer the seat they are comfortable they want to sit so i mean it's very sad you know the people don't have that you know human qualities in them and uh, uh, this bullying you know this bullying has become so common when you know that a person is you know vulnerable you automatically you want to you know like uh, you know squeeze that person you want to you know like isolate the person and not only isolate humiliate that person okay so that is very common in a society but that doesn't help in building relationship you never know how that person can be useful to you in future you never know when that person can be useful to you so therefore uh, and moreover uh, we we should believe in that that uh, when when we help others actually we are um, you know moving closer to our, towards god or we are helping god in turn and god will definitely help us when we are in need and then take responsibility of your own actions we tend to blame it on others all the time this blame game you know continues so um so if the if sometimes you know the child you know doesn't uh, do well in the examination uh, the you know, first of all the child is uh, blames uh, his mother that because of you i did not do well in the examination you did not give me this you did not give me that so therefore i did not do well in the examination then the mother in turn you know starts blaming the teacher the teacher did not teach well and so therefore uh, you know my child did not uh, fare well in the examination and so on this blame game continues but what about trying to reflect you know within ourselves and finding out you know what was the reason why we failed uh, what what action of ours you know needs improvement so that you know we can uh, you know rectify you know and try not to fail the next time try to clear the examination so all this aspects you know require reflection and then set personal boundaries now we have to be very careful with our relationship we have to first of all uh, find out you know who is the one for whom we can trust and then we can share share our personal you know feelings or a personal you know problems with that person unless and until you know we are assured that the person is trustworthy um, we should not you know share our personal problems with all people okay there should be a boundary we should not cross the boundary beyond that um, we we are not supposed to talk about uh, any of our personal um, problems so uh, with this i would like to share a video um, so uh, sir would you please uh, play the video sir and then you know they can come back to the presentation once again A shop owner once placed a sign above his door that said puppies for sale. Signs like this always have a way of attracting young children. And to no surprise, a boy saw the sign and approached the owner. The boy asked, "How much are you going to sell the puppies for?" The owner replied, "Anywhere from $30 to $50." The little boy pulled out some change from his pocket. He said, "I have $2." Can I please have a look at them? The shop owner smiled and showed him the puppies. Down the aisle of his shop, but 
one puppy was lagging behind. Immediately, the little boy signaled out the lagging limping puppy and said, What's wrong with that little dog? The shop owner explained that the veterinary doctor had examined the little puppy and had discovered it didn't have a hip socket. That's why it would always limp. The little boy became excited. He said, That is the puppy I want to buy. The shop owner said, No, you don't want to buy that little dog. If you really want him, I'll just give him to you. The little boy got quite upset. He looked straight into the owner's eyes, pointing his finger and said, I don't want you to give him to me. That little dog is worth every bit, as much as all the other dogs, and I'll pay full price. In fact, I'll give you two dollars now and fifty cents a month until I have him paid for. The shop owner countered, You really don't want to buy this little dog. He will never be able to run and jump and play with you like the other puppies. And the little boy reached down, rolled up his pant and revealed a badly twisted, crippled leg supported by a big metal brace and he looked up at the shop owner and said, Well, I don't run so well myself. And the little puppy will need someone who understands. Okay, thank you for uh, sharing the video. Uh, so with that, I like to end my uh, presentation today. Uh, so I thank all of you for um, patient listening. And I would like also to uh, give you my uh, contact details. You can call me in this number. This is my WhatsApp number also. When you want to inquire about how to go ahead with the reflective practices, and this is my mail ID. You can also, um, you know, share your views in, a, in my mail ID. And of course, I have my YouTube channel where you can actually find out, you know, what uh, games I have designed, um, online games I have designed, you know, in the YouTube channel uh, so that, you know, students are able to use it. And of course, I have my website also where I have incorporated a lot of information about games. So with that, I would like to say thank you once again to all of you. And if there are any questions, I am ready to answer those questions.